mindfulness of death is an interesting meditation in that it very rarely functions on its own. It piggybacks on other topics. There's one passage where the Buddha says, if you really want to be heedful, you remind yourself each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out, may I live for this one more breath. I could accomplish a lot. In other words, it's mindfulness of death focuses you on the breath and what you can do with the breath. If you simply think, with each breath, I could do a lot, I could do a lot, I could do a lot, you don't get much done. You ask yourself, well, what needs to be done? Look at the breath in terms of bodily fabrication, the way you talk to yourself, verbal fabrication, the perceptions and feelings you focus on, mental fabrication. What needs to be worked on in those three things? What insight can you gain into the process of fabrication as you work with them? That's the work that needs to be done. So mindfulness of death is a guardian meditation in the sense that it focuses our attention right here, right now, and then encourages us to do the work that needs to be done right here, right now. It's interesting then. Modern Buddhism, the present moment, is seen as an end in itself, a practice to get into the present moment and to stay there. But from the Buddhist point of view, we get into the present moment because there's work to be done that will have an impact on how we face death. So instead of being a topic to avoid thinking about death, staying right here in the present moment is important because it allows us to master the skills we're going to need at the point when death comes. This is how it's a guardian meditation. In fact, the other guardian meditations also benefit from mindfulness of death. Because as the Buddha said, there are four things that we fear as we approach death. And the guardian meditations help us with those. We fear losing the central pleasures we've had in this life. We fear losing the body. We're afraid that if we've done unskillful things in the past, there may be punishment waiting for us on the other side. And then finally, we just really don't know what's going to happen if we haven't seen the Dharma, if we haven't gained the Dharma, there's going to be doubts about the true Dharma, and those doubts can really cause fear. What's going to happen? Is there nothing at all after death? Is there rebirth? And what kind of rebirth is it, and how is it going to happen? Those are legitimate fears, and the different guardian meditations help us with them. Fear of missing out on sensuality and fear of losing the body. If you had some experience dealing with the contemplation of the body, it helps to overcome some of those fears. You realize that what you've got here in terms of the body is not all that much. There's a lot of pain and there's a lot of trouble that comes with the body. You think of each part of the body, and there's a series of diseases that goes along with each. So if you can overcome your attachment to the body through the contemplation, it makes you a lot less afraid of leaving it when the time comes. Otherwise you'll hover around after you could die. Like that spirit the woman saw in the envelopes behind Wamakut. Envelopes in Thailand are these little structures in which they're about the size of a coffin, just a little bit bigger than a coffin. You stick a coffin in and you seal it up with plaster. They use these in Thailand because often it, when somebody dies, the family's not ready to hold the funeral quite yet. Maybe somebody's away, or they don't have the money yet. And so they keep the body in, in what they call an envelope and wait until they're ready. And then they take it out. There's a whole field of these envelopes behind Wabakud where John Fung taught meditation. One night this one woman was sitting and meditating, and she had a vision where people were performing a ceremony where 
a coffin was being placed in an envelope, and there was a man standing right next to the envelope wearing a suit. And after the ceremony was over, everybody left except for him. And he looked left and right, and then went soup into the envelope. It startled her. So without saying anything to anybody, she left the meditation room, went down to where the ceremony just happened, and asked some of the people who were leaving, the person who died, did he look like this? And she described the man in the suit. And I said, yep, that's the man. So she went back to say, John Fum, I asked him, well, what do I do now? He said, well, try to meditate and see if you can get that vision again. And she did. He said, okay, now look inside the envelope. And the spirit was perched there, hovering right next to its body, not knowing where to go. So John Fung said, well, dedicate the merit of your meditation to him. So she did. She said it was like a light going out of her chest, like a headlamp. And the spirit looked at her, and there was this flash in his eyes, and he left. As so John Fung said, sometimes he would go around in the evening there at Wamakut. They had a lot of funerals there. They'd have these little pavilions where the funerals would be held. Came back one evening after walking around and said, You know, the number of people who die and hang around their bodies is an awful lot. It's because people are so attached to their bodies that they can't conceive of being any place else but around the body. Well, a corpse is not something you want to hang around. So it's good to see that there's nothing here to really that's really worth holding on to. The more you contemplate the body, the more it can pry you away from your attachment to the body. And that's so afraid of leaving it. As for fear of things that you've done in the past that you might be punished for, the Buddha said the best way to deal with that kind of fear is one, to remember that just because you've done something bad in the past doesn't mean you have to go to a bad place after you die. You have a change of heart, maintain right view. That can protect you. And so part of right view is recognizing, okay, that was a mistake that you made. You can't go back and change what you did. But you can resolve not to repeat that mistake. That's more right view. And then have goodwill for everybody. The person you wronged, yourself, all people and everywhere. And as you maintain that attitude of goodwill, that too is a protection. It helps to overcome some of the fears of what you've done in the past. As for the fear that comes from not having seen the true Dharma, the only way you're going to or totally overcome that fear, of course, is to get, have your first taste of stream entry. But in the meantime, you can develop strong conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Think about what he learned about rebirth. Because what he learned about rebirth in the course of his awakening is an important lesson in how to prepare for death. After all, knowing that you're going to die and thinking about it, it could come at any time. If you don't think about what actually happens at death, you can come up with all kinds of wrong ways of reacting to that news, either fear, or you might decide, well, what the hell? Life is short, enjoy it as much as you can, and you go out and do all kinds of unskillful things. But as the Buddha pointed out, we're reborn in line with our karma, and we're reborn in line with our cravings at the moment of death. It's not just what you did in this particular life, but it's also the state of your mind when you die. He compares it to a fire leaving one house and going to another one. It's carried along by the wind. In, in the physics at that time, they believed that the fire actually latched onto the wind, clung to the wind. And in this case, he says, you cling to your craving. They might think that that's pretty good and I can go where I want to go. But the nature of craving is it's pretty blind. And if the mind is out of control, all kinds of weird cravings can come up at the moment of death. You can think about it. You're leaving this realm. You're leaving this body. You're being evicted. 
And there's a lot of pain that goes along with death. So a lot of times people either go for sensual craving, as, as they see that that's the only way you can avoid focusing on pain, or they're simply afraid that they'll go out of existence, so they latch onto any kind of existence that occurs to them. Or they may decide that life is so much suffering they'd just rather be snuffed out. Well, that takes you to another state of being as well. And all the hindrances can come in at that time. There can be doubt. There can be restlessness and anxiety. There can be drowsiness. Ill will can come up, as you remember people who have wronged you in the past, along with sensual desire. And they can take over. You've seen this in your own mind as you meditate. You're sitting here. Every, all the circumstances around you are fine. Everything's quiet. Your body's not doing anything outrageous in terms of creating pain or illness. The circumstances are ideal, and even then the hindrances can take over. So what's going to happen when the body is falling apart and your life is ending? If you can't control the mind, keep it away from the hindrances now, how are you going to keep it away then? So when you reflect on this, this gives you a good idea of how you should prepare. You've really got to work on overcoming the hindrances. And you can use those guardian meditations to help overcome your fears. And you can work on the breath, because as I said, the way the Buddha teaches the breath as a topic of meditation, focuses on fabrication, bodily, verbal, mental. And these are the things that are going to shape your cravings. These are the things that are going to shape your state of mind. Soon you get really skilled at handling these things, seeing them clearly and noticing how you can develop skillful fabrications and how you can let go of unskillful ones. If you get really skilled, get beyond fabrication entirely. But you're not going to get beyond it unless you really understand how to do it well. When you've mastered these things, that's when you're ready. That's when you're prepared, and you can have some confidence that you'll know what to do, and you do it well. So mindfulness of death isn't just thinking, die, 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 I'm going to die. Sometimes those thoughts are useful when you find yourself sitting here meditating and thinking about all kinds of pleasures that you're missing right now. And you're going to say, well, I could die at any moment. This is not a good time to be thinking about those things. And the fact that I'm going to die means, how much are those things really worth? And then you reflect, well, what do I have to do? I have to get ready. Because it's not just that when you die, events take over. I mean, it happens for a lot of people. They just allow events to take over, but you can't trust events to take you to a good place. You've got to strengthen your mind, strengthen your intentions, strengthen it your understanding of what's happening in the mind. So when you are face to face with difficult issues as you're leaving the body, you'll be prepared. And John Mahabu gave a series of talks one time to a woman who was dying of cancer. After she died, the talks were transcribed, published in a big volume, and it was called The Dharma for Getting Prepared. And when you think about it, that's what all the Buddhist teachings are about. When he left home, it was because he was trying to look for something that didn't age, didn't grow ill, didn't die. And what he taught, he taught, taught us how not to suffer from these things, either as we go through them or as we discover something that takes us beyond aging, illness, and death entirely. This is where everything is focused. Which is why mindfulness of death gathers into it all kinds of meditation topics. 
You can trace every meditation topic, every skill about the things you need to abandon, to mindfulness of death. That's how they're all connected. That's why mindfulness of death is such a good meditation topic for encouraging you to get really good at the other topics. That's a play an important role when the time comes to go.